好久好久以前，喺一片大森林里面，生长着一棵大树。大森林里嘅小动物都喜欢喺大树下面唱歌、跳舞、玩游戏，大家都叫佢做大树公公。嗰、那个时候，小动物呢系冇耳朵噶噃，听唔到风声、雨声，听唔到欢笑、歌声。亦都睇唔到彼此，聽唔到彼此嘅呼喚，所以大樹公公見到小動物嗰種天真無邪嘅笑面，佢非常着急，佢諗咗七九日九夜，突然諗到自己滿身嘅樹葉，如果能夠將佢送俾小動物做耳朵，唔係一件好好嘅事嗎？鳳姨睇到大樹公公嘅心事。佢就對大樹公公講啦：唔可以咁樣噶，你將樹葉都摘落嚟，你會有生命危險噶。魚婆婆知道咗大樹公公嘅想法，佢都對大樹公公講：樹葉係你生命中最重要嘅部分，你要用六葉素進行光合作用，製造營養，失去樹葉。就等於失去咗你嘅生命。大樹公公笑着咁對佢哋講：，你哋唔使勸我啦，只要小動物能夠有兩隻可以聽到各種美妙聲音嘅耳朵，我願意付出自己嘅一切。就咁樣，大樹公公呢，就摘低曬佢每身上每一片嘅樹葉，送俾。每一隻小動物啊，大象咧就得到兩片好大嘅樹葉喎，所以佢有兩隻好大嘅耳朵。小老鼠咧就得到兩片小小嘅樹葉，所以咧佢只係攞到兩隻細耳朵啦。小白兔、小松鼠、小肥豬，每一種動物都有兩隻可以聽到各種聲音嘅小耳朵，就喺大樹公公。摘、就是、下佢身上最後一片樹葉嘅時候，就失去咗綠色生命嘅時候啦。小動物都喊咯喎，小動物嘅眼淚浸濕咗大樹公公身上所有嘅枝條，枝條紛紛落在地上，生根發芽，變成一棵棵綠色嘅樹樹苗。大樹公公滿心微笑嘅。融入咗他腳下嘅樹泥土裏面。後來呢個樹樹，呢些呢啲樹樹苗咧，就成長咗一棵棵枝繁葉茂嘅大樹，一棵棵大樹又組成咗一片大大嘅森林。Thank you, Susanna Pai, for the wonderful Chinese children's story. Called Grandpa Tree in Mandarin. Welcome to our fourth Letting Library lecture series of 2023, entitled Chinese Immigrants, Contributions, and Exclusion. This year, we are celebrating City of Milwaukee's 120th anniversary of incorporation. Our town is now officially recognized as 120 years old. This does not mean people in life did not call this place home before. But is the date the state recognizes our existence? Tonight, we are blessed to have our partners from Northwest China Council discuss the Chinese Exclusion Act and introduce their organization. We will begin with the, the lecture with City Council President Nicodemus on the importance of telling all stories of Milwaukee history. A special address by Dr. Steve Bennett about the Milwaukee Museum. Then Jim Mockford and David Cole of Northwest China Council will discuss the organization. We will then share a bit of Milwaukee Chinese history, and then our keynote speaker, Janet Lee, will expand on the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, its impacts and effects on Chinese immigration and contributions. My name is Greg Hemer, the Communications Director for the Milwaukee Historical Society. Council President Nicodemus is the champion of Council's diversity goals. He was elected in 2020. And was recently designated to be council president in 
He has always strived to make sure all voices are heard when making decisions. Even though that he is actually from Ohio, he chooses to root for Michigan football, but that is his only flaw. <laughs> he and his wife have lived all around the world from Turkey to Brazil, and he brings his experience as a teacher, a mentor, and a world traveler to enrich our city. Desi has helped Milwaukee Museum through speaking events, securing grants, and supporting our vision of telling all the voices of Milwaukee history like this one tonight. Tonight, Council President Nicodemus will communicate the importance of telling all the stories of Milwaukee. Please welcome Council President Desi Nicodemus. Thank you, thank you for having me here. I don't know if the Chicago Bears will win a game with an Ohio State quarterback, but good luck. Um, I also, I, I'm really happy to be here. I lived in Turkey, Brazil, and I also spent two years in China, uh, in Ningbo, specifically Beilun as well. Uh, so here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Milwaukeeans, today I stand before you to emphasize the crucial importance of embracing and preserving all histories and voices within the city of Milwaukee. Our collective history is not just a record of the past, but a reflection of who we are as a community and a testament to our commitment to diversity, inclusivity, and social progress. Milwaukee, like any other city, has a rich tapestry of histories and voices that deserve to be heard, acknowledged, and celebrated. When we talk about history, it's not just about the prominent figures or major events. It's about the everyday experiences, struggles, and contributions of all residents, past and present. One of the primary reasons for embracing all histories and voices is to preserve our cultural heritage. Milwaukee is a diverse city with people from various backgrounds and walks of life. Each of these communities has unique stories, traditions, and experiences that have shaped our city. By recognizing and preserving these histories, we ensure that our cultural identity remains vibrant and meaningful. Inclusivity is at the heart of any thriving community. When we include all histories and voices, we send a powerful message that everyone's stories matter. This, is, this not only fosters a sense of belonging among all residents, but it also promotes social cohesion and understanding. It encourages dialogue and builds bridges between different groups, ultimately leading to a more harmonious community. History is a valuable teacher. By studying all aspects of our history, including the difficult and uncomfortable chapters, we gain insight into the mistakes of the past and can strive to create a more just and equitable future. It's through a comprehensive understanding of our history that we can address issues like discrimination, inequality, and social injustice with greater wisdom and empathy. When we tell stories of those who came before us, we inspire future generations to be active participants in their community's history. It's essential for young people to see themselves reflected in the narratives of their city, as this can empower them to become leaders and change makers who contribute positively to Milwaukee's future. Embracing all histories and voices can also have practical benefits for our city. Moreover, it can make Milwaukee a more appealing place for individuals and families looking for a welcoming an inclusive community in which to live. A democracy thrives when all voices are heard by actively seeking out and including the perspectives of marginalized and underrepresented communities. We strengthen our de democratic institutions. It allows us to make informed decisions that consider the needs and aspirations of all residents, leading to a more effective and equitable governance. In conclusion, embracing all histories and voices within the city of Milwaukee is not just a moral imperative, but it's also a practical necessity. 
It preserves our cultural heritage, fosters inclusivity, teaches us a valuable lesson from the past, inspires future generations, and even brings economic development benefits. It's a way to build a stronger, more resilient, and more compassionate community. Let us commit ourselves to these tasks of inclusion, not as a burden, but as an opportunity to create a brighter and more united Milwaukee for all of its residents. By acknowledging the richness of our diverse histories and voices, we can truly claim to be a city that values every individual and every story that contributes to our shared narrative. Thank you. This program is being produced by our great partner, Willamette Falls Studios. Willamette Falls Studios' mission is to inspire lifelong learning, advance knowledge, and define communications through digital media technology to educate and strengthen communities. Their professional staff work daily to create media content for local organizations, capture city projects, consult on productions, customize broadcast systems, and provide technical support. WFS works with all levels of experience in media production. Residents can learn how to be a community producer at little to no out-of-pocket cost. Come in and talk to their staff about how they can help you with your communication needs. Willamette Falls Studios, where you learn, create, and belong. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Steve Bennett, Milwaukee Historical Society President. Over the past several years, Dr. Bennett has focused his attention on local property research and helping many individuals uncover things they don't know about the places and people who contribute to making them who they are today. Dr. Bennett has a wide-ranging academic background, BA in philosophy, MA and PhD in Near Eastern languages, MBA in management. He worked in information technology as a project manager for over 30 years and is now currently retired. Sort of. It is amazing the talent residents of Milwaukee have. Steve is absolutely no exception to that. He is, not only his knowledge of local history has huge amount of benefits to society, but his IT background creates better operating systems and solves many of the dilemmas that we face in the technological world. Thank you is never enough, Steve, for your effort, time, and devotion, but basically, thank you. Please welcome Dr. Steve Bennett. Evening. The Milwaukee Historical Society is the owner and operator of the world's largest museum dedicated to Milwaukee, Oregon. <laughs> we're located at 3737 Southeast Adams Street and we're open 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturdays. Yes, we have a museum. It's the building you've been driving by for 15 years and said, one of these days I'm going to stop in, but never have. Trust me, if you do, you will enjoy it. We would love to have you. Come in to learn more about the historical past of the town we call Milwaukee. From all perspectives, we pride ourselves in telling the history because the past is the past, it doesn't matter whether it's good, bad, or ugly. We tell it. That's important. We work with organizations like the Oregon Black Pioneers, Clackamas County Heritage Council, Japanese American Museum of Oregon, Northwest China Council, the Grand Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron, to expand our knowledge and to tell the histories of all the people who have lived in this area that we call Milwaukee today. Our membership dollars pay for the operations of the museum, making admission free. 
so that we remove barriers of income equality for all those who want to learn about the great city that we call Milwaukee. So 2023 has been a great year for us. We're now holding the fourth of our Letting Library series lectures. We had three live performances in the back of the museum with over 300 guests coming uh, on Saturdays, two performances uh, you know, for, three, for three times. We have created our newest exhibit on Milwaukee's historic women, activists, leaders, and great personalities. Come by the museum any Saturday, 11 to 4, and talk to our great docents, but learn about the history of Milwaukee. Milwaukee Museum is funded through donations and memberships. I urge you to consider becoming a member today or when you come in to visit. Memberships for individuals are only $20. An organization is $100. By becoming a member, you will receive information about upcoming events, uh, member-only member gatherings, and the opportunity that the museum has to offer you. An organization member provides you with advertising on all of our communications and provides opportunities for the museum to become involved with your events. Either way, you become a member, your dollars will help ensure that you are preserving Milwaukee's history for future generations and you are contributing to the wonderful programming like tonight's presentation. Check out our website at www.milwaukeemuseum.com to join or stop in the museum. Thank you sincerely to all of our residents, uh, past, present, and future, for your continued support. Thanks. One of our other partners in programming is the Letting, in the Letting Library Lecture Series is the Letting Library. Come check out the remainder of the author programming on October 12th, 19th, and 25th. The authors Brian Lowry, Selfless, The Social Creation of You, Shatters the Myth of Individualism, and Frees Ourselves to Make Our Lives and the World Accordingly. Author Aly Alyssa Max Goodman, Glitter and Concrete, traces the technicolor history of drag in New York City and the role it's played in both queer culture and urban life. And author Casey Parks, Diary of a Misfit, a memoir and a mystery, follows the mystery of a stranger's past, forced to reckon with her own sexuality, her fraught Southern identity, her relationship with her mother, and the complicated role of faith in her life. Come check it out. Jim Mockford is president of the Northwest China Council. Northwest China Council was established in 1980. Their mission is to promote a greater understanding of Chinese history, culture, business, and contemporary affairs in the Pacific Northwest. Jim's willingness to work with the Milwaukee Historical Society and the Milwaukee Arts Committee has led not only to this program, but a permanent sculpture celebrating the Bing Cherry and its related Chinese history. The universe works in weird ways. Jim kind of came in sideways into the Milwaukee Historical Museum's life. But we ended up with some great panels, some extra research, and some brand new friends. So here tonight, please welcome Jim Mockford. Well, thank you for that great introduction, Greg. And I'm not sure I went in sideways, but I did go to the museum twice. And um, Steve, you'll be happy to know this. And um, found amazing materials about Ah Bing and, and the Llewellyn family and horticulture and lots more history than I could go through. But it was really Samantha Swindler who came to us some months ago and said, you know, we're thinking about doing something about Ah Bing in Milwaukee. <laughs> and that uh, is why I went to the museum to start with and then met some really great folks. And I want to thank everyone here who is um, part of this, the Letting Library, the City of Milwaukee, 
uh, the Milwaukee History Museum and all your supporters. Um, you touched on our, our mission. We were formed uh, 43 years ago, 1980, to promote a better understanding of Chinese history, culture, business, and contemporary affairs around the Pacific Northwest. Although we're Portland-based, we get out. We get out to Milwaukee, Oregon, and other places around the Northwest to find out what are the stories that connect that community to China and to the international scene. Um, if you are not able to come into one of our events, we've been online for a few years doing things on Zoom. And so uh, we, this year we're doing both some in-person and online activities. Um, and it's mentioned uh, that we were uh, partners with the Oregon Children's Theater uh, show of Where the Mountain Meets the Moon in the Spring. And then over to the Architectural Heritage Center just last week, Val Ballstrom is in the audience tonight, was our speaker. And we had a great uh, program uh, at that uh, facility talking about the um, community builder, Wei Li. And so we're really happy to be over on the east side for a couple of programs now uh, this fall. Uh, our past lectures are available on Zoom. Uh, you can go to our, on YouTube, I should say. They were live on Zoom, and then they're posted to our uh, YouTube site. And um, not all the in-person lectures have the ability to do what we're doing this evening to capture the program on Zoom or put it on YouTube. So some lectures are omitted, but um, these are some of the examples of the types of lectures we've had uh, over the last couple of years during the pandemic. Fortunately, we're not running YouTube right now. Uh, we've had some great book talks. We've had creative professionals talk about their um, work, uh, like with animation and things like that in China. We had a, there we go. So. This evening, I, when I was asked to talk a little bit about this story, um, uh, I said, well, I, I want to talk about a little bit of a prequel. Because before the city of Milwaukee was established, what you said, 120 years ago, uh, we had a connection to China that started with the very first ships that came to the Northwest with Cap after Captain Cook's voyage. Uh, I was introduced to the story by J.R. Noakes. Richard Noakes was the editor of the Argonian. He wrote the book Columbia's River for the 1992 Maritime Bicentennial. He wrote Almost a Hero about John Mears. And in that, those ships took furs from the coastal areas, sea otter furs, to China. The Mears ships brought Chinese on board the ship uh, as workmen to Vancouver Island, where they were on board those ships. And then a fellow uh, that I also met, um, uh, uh, Charles Parkin Jr was the co-author of the, of the book about Robert Gray, Captain Gray. He was also the founder of the Garibaldi Museum, which I recommend when you're down in Garibaldi, go see what they have to say about the fur trade at the Garibaldi Museum. And so it was a real pleasure to meet both of those authors um, now some 30 plus years ago. Uh, and they talked about the maritime fur trade, which was not just along the coast or in the estuary of the Columbia, but right up to Milwaukee, the Willamette Falls, the Meldrum Bar, and um, these uh, ships came later in the 1820s. And the young face you see there is uh, Captain John Dominus on the Brig Owyhee. It was known to have entered the river. Uh, uh, he's with an American flag. Uh, but coming up to first to Fort Vancouver area and then up to as far as he could get. And as you know, there's the Clackamas Rapids uh, in the Meldrum Bar caused a little bit of trouble for ships of that size. So that's as far as they got. But they traded with the Native Americans both salmon, they were taken at the falls, salted and put into barrels and sent back to Boston, where they were taxed as foreign trade goods, which if the British had known, it might have helped them in the negotiation uh, to secure this region for themselves. But uh, it wasn't known that that had happened, even though they paid duty. Uh, and partly that might have been because Captain Domus disappeared uh, in a shipwreck on a voyage to China in the 1840s. But anyway, I gave a talk about him some years ago. Uh, and as you see, uh, there were uh, actual um, bills of lading that showed that he had both you know, otter and seal skins and other things to be delivered to the port of Canton. And um, he circumnavigated back to Boston. And he was considered competition by Dr. McLaughlin and the Hudson's Bay Company. So um, the links will take you to a longer story that I published about him. But he's also mentioned in the book there, Free Land for Free Men, OK, interesting title. Uh, that was by a local historian. Um, and uh, 
and I actually have articles by Vera before she was married. Did I get her name in the, in the here? It's on the cover. slide, but I should definitely do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. And actually, uh, I have newspaper articles. So she was a, a reporter who wrote for newspapers before she wrote the book. Now, the book is a pretty good source, but there's a little bit of a trick to the title because the land was free, partly because the very brig that you see here brought malaria to the Columbia River and devastated the Native American tribes all up and down the river. And a great book about that is Robert Boyd's A Coming of the Spirit, uh, Coming of the Age of Pestilence, and talks about the mortality rates, which were worse for Native Americans here in that period than the Black Death, and actually the Hiroshima was a very high mortality rate. And so the land was free because there were a lot of people that were no longer here to trade, to trade such things as fur that had been taken to China in earlier years. I don't have the touch, Greg, for that. Oh, there we go. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, the free land then is available to pioneers that showed up, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, the Native Americans were not only decimated in numbers, but you can imagine the trauma that if most of your tribe has been uh, lost to a, a, an epidemic, um, uh, it would have been a difficult time. And then all of a sudden, new people are showing up on covered wagons as well as ships. And some of those folks didn't just bring their cooking gear. Some people brought trees, and the Llewellings did that. Uh, there's a great story about this, and I'd love to go into a long story about their family, but this, this uh, illustration you see of Seth Llewelling we found at the Milwaukee History Museum. And behind him is an illustration of Ah Bing. And of course, we don't really know that that's Ah Bing. It's a, it's a likeness an artist created. But it was remembered by um, Florence Letting many years later, as she remembered meeting him as a child, that he was a bigger fellow. He was from Manchuria, and that um, uh, you know he stood out from the other Chinese laborers that were in the area, probably from, excuse me, mostly from southern China. We do, ha however, have uh, a good look at Chen Wing on the right, who was a cook for post commander Thomas Anderson at the Vancouver Barracks and for some years, not just 1890 when the picture was taken. And Fort Vancouver as the um, uh, you know, center of the area's history now at this point because of the Hudson's Bay Company and then the coming of the American military to take over that, that area as a barracks um, has a great deal of history and photographs and stories about the Chinese that lived on on at the fort. And so Chen Wing may have been wearing the type of attire that Ah Bing could have worn, uh, but this is a different class of, of, of Chinese uh, living here than the laborers at, uh, at the railroads and mines and um, canneries and all sorts of places that, that uh, Chinese immigrants worked. So there's some links to websites at Fort Vancouver. The Friends of Fort Vancouver um, actually told me they'd love to be here tonight. They were worried about the government shutdown, so they didn't want to commit to coming and joining us because I invited them to come share some of their resources. But they administer the McLaughlin House in Oregon City as part of the National Park Service uh, Fort Vancouver. Um, oh, oh, now I got to go back. Oh, there we go. OK, so this brings us to the McLaughlin House which is now celebrating the 20th year of being part of the Park Service. And that banner you see was actually at the Fort Vancouver Visitor Center just recently. And um, what you see is some photos of it back in the day. And back in the day means the time of Chinese exclusion. Because that facility, after Dr. McLaughlin passed away, became a hotel. It became a number of things. and. Um, uh, it was the place that uh, Chinese workers in the mills were residing at the time that they were rounded up in 1886 and expelled from Oregon City. They were marched down to the 8th Street dock, put on the Latona, which is the, the riverboat on the right of that photo, and then that boat departed Oregon City uh, with the expelled Chinese, going right past Milwaukee, possibly looking at sites like the the, the Milwaukee from the river that you see down there. Uh, and that's the, the story of um, exclusion that Aubing would have faced. And we don't know a lot of details about his life other than that his work was recognized by the Wallon family. They gave him credit for inventing the Bing cherry. 
There's a lot of information about that in the History Museum. But when he returns to China, he, does, he, he disappears from history. We don't know. There's no record of what happened. Um, he could not come back because of the Exclusion Act. And maybe he didn't want to because of incidents like this that were happening right up the river from here, as well as in Portland, Tacoma, and all across the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and some with very dire consequences, such as the Massacre for Gold story written by Dick Noakes' son, Greg Noakes, who wrote the book about the massacre in Eastern Oregon. Well, this story we're just starting to get into, and um, I could, as you see, talk for some time about all these interesting things. But we will present uh, some of this again through our newsletter and with links like this so you can click on and find out more about the actual um, episode, which has just re recently been sort of rediscovered by local historians. And through um, events like this, I'm sure there'll be more uh, information forthcoming uh, as stories continue to, to be shared. Well, um, I'm getting close to my time limit here. And um, maybe <laughs> the button doesn't work. There you go. Uh, oh, so tonight we're remembering uh, very appropriately Ah Bing, but it's in this larger story that we're presenting about Chinese exclusion as well uh, and, and the contributions of, of Chinese uh, in the area. Who, who stayed became Americans, and um, some were not expelled, <laughs> and some came at other times. But Florence Letting, uh, born in 1870, uh, is, a, is a historical character in her own right. Um, it mentions her uh, career in law. And then at the age of around 60, she documented her memories of Bing, and that's the part where we got some view that, that he was probably a northern Chinese, like a Manchurian, we don't know precisely where he came from, but that his row was next to Llewellyn's row in the nursery test area. And because that cherry fruited on Bing's row, he was given the name, the, the Bing cherry got its name. And I think the Llewellyns deserve another history talk because of their interesting family history. Uh, uh, going back to before they came out here, um, they were um, uh, involved in, um, the Underground Railroad, for one, among other things. And uh, uh, so um, they, they deserve uh, another history session all on their own. Uh, Florence Letting passed away in 1961. The historical posters are now blocking some of the, <laughs> the illustration or painting that you see of her. But it's a wonderful place to remember this story as here at the Letting Library. And with that, let me introduce our former uh, Northwest uh, China Council President, David Cole, current board member, very active as a business consultant with China. And he's a local resident of Milwaukee. And if the button works, he'll get to announce one of our future programs that involves cherries. But uh, David, please uh, come on up and, and share your, your insights with us. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, it, it's just a great pleasure to be here. Um, this event is very heartwarming to me. It's a combination of multiple passions that I have. I've been a resident in Milwaukee since 2005. Um, been involved in just the beautiful uh, development of this, of this city. Um, and you know where I where I live, it, you know it was built in 1878. It's the Burkmeyer Sweetland Estate, just up the road here on Kellogg Lake. Um, so it has a lot of history that I looked into, and um, a lot of that involved Llewellyn, just the area, the development of industry here, I guess. Um, but I was so pleased to see that the story of Abe, it really just affected me because I'm also separately before that for 20 plus years, I've been with the China Council, I've been very, very engaged in, in trying to facilitate human to human understanding and communication um, in an apolitical sense, which I think is very important given the, the timing of this, the story of it being is just really heartwarming, again, 
because it was during a very difficult time politically. That comes and goes, you know, and, and we're not necessarily in the, the most comfortable time as well, but it's so important that we come together as a community like this and discuss and recognize the human to human interaction and just the beauty of community, I guess, and understanding. And so I'm just very, very pleased to see this in my area. And um, so anyway, that's enough about that. Uh, I'm really looking forward to um, this, this talk by Keith Hu and um, the Northwest Cherry Growers. Um, and so I hope that you can all attend. I think I'm going to just leave it at that because I think we have a number of interesting things to hear about. So thank you very much. I'm not going to make fun of Jim, but. Uh, and so uh, Northwest China Council just wants to say thank you, of course. and. <laughs> thank you uh, both. A heartwarming uh, story. Thank you for all, all of your hard work that you guys put together. And, and it, the story is absolutely correct, is that uh, the more that we can learn about each other's past, the more of a community building that we can build in the future. I mean, really, that, that is really the point of this program. Join community leaders and city staff to cut the ribbon on the new City Hall building. Festivities begin at 4 p.m. at Historic City Hall at 10772 or 10722 Southeast Main Street. Say goodbye and say hello to the, uh, the, from the building that was 85 years of service before parading down Main Street to the new City Hall building at 10501 Southeast Main Street with special guests and the Milwaukee High School Marching Band. The public is invited uh, uh, the public is invited to tour the new City Hall building and enjoy refreshments during an opening house to follow. So here we go, everybody, because uh, you can't see that or you can see it, but it, let's look at it. This, the timeline is ceremony at Historic uh, City Hall starts at 4 o'clock. At 4.20, the parade begins down to the new City Hall. At 4.45, the ribbon cutting at the new City Hall. The public is invited to tour the new City Hall at the conclusion of the ribbon cutting. And by the way, I got to go to our very first uh, city council meeting there uh, last night, and uh, I can tell that Mr. Stoffer had a hand in uh, helping to define the stairs as they're walking. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, it is an excellent, excellent job, the way that uh, they represent uh, our city. So come on down. I won't spoil it for you, so come on down and come and check it on out. Uh, the museum will have a table there as well, uh, so you can come and talk to me at that point in time. The two Chinese immigrants I am discussing tonight not only tell a story about themselves, but impress the history of Milwaukee. We begin with a bit of background on each story and then explore the individuals. Henderson Llewellyn was a nursery uh, man for many years in Indiana and later in Iowa. Inspired by the Lewis and Clark exhibitions, he became an enthusiastic admirer of Oregon. In the fall of 1845, Mr. Luong began his plans and on April 17th, 1847, started from Salem, Iowa on the long trek to Oregon with his family of seven children and saplings of various fruit varieties. The 700 fruit trees and canes were planted in two boxes with rich soil and charcoal. The boxes completely filled the wagon and were drawn by three oxen. By early October, the Llewellyns reached the Dalles and then ferried to eventually Milwaukee on November 17th, 1847. With his friends, the Meeks, they planted the surviving 350 trees into the ground around what we call Waverly Country Club today. Later, Llewellyn moved and created Fruitvale, California, which is near Oakland. Meek headed towards the John Day area, and Henderson needed someone to run the orchards in Milwaukee, so in 1850, his brother, Seth Llewellyn, came into Milwaukee and expanded the orchards. 
Seth Lilling later became the founding father of the Oregon State Fair and the Oregon Republican Party. His many varieties of fruits include Golden Prune, Sweet Alice Apple, uh, the, the Lambert, uh, Black Republican, and Bing Cherries. Today it is said that you can trace the $2 billion fruit industry on the Pacific Coast to the trees that came from Milwaukee. Seth Luong Nursery in Milwaukee cultivated the Bing cherry, which was named in honor of the nursery's Chinese foreman, Ah Bing. The little we know today about Ah Bing's life comes from Florence Olson Letting, Seth Luelling's stepdaughter, who was interviewed in the 1939 as part of a Works Project Progress Administration oral history project on the area. Letting said Ah Bing was from northern China, unlike many of the Chinese immigrants to Oregon at the time, who were Cantonese from Southeast China. Bing was close to six feet tall, if not taller. He was the foreman to about 30 or more Chinese laborers, using, usually working in the orchards. He worked in Milwaukee for some 30 years. Bing was very fond of an old parlor song that was popular at the time, and Lenning recalled that he would sing it over and over again in a melancholy minor key. The manner in which the cherry was named for him happened that he and my stepfather were working the trees every other row each, Letting told the interviewer. Seth, you ought to name this for, for yourself. Seth responded, I've already got one in my name. No, name this for Bing. It's a big cherry and Bing's big. And by that way, it's in his row so the name shall be. Bing had a family back in China, or at least he had a wife there to whom he sent money regularly. His wife uh, had adopted six or seven boys in her husband's absence. Letting said Bing wanted to go back and see his wife and sons. Finally, in either 1889 or 1890, he traveled to China and never returned. Letting blamed the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act which banned the immigration of Chinese laborers to the United States as a reason why he never returned to Oregon. From the turn of the 20th century to about the late 30s, Milwaukee was an entertainment district for the Portland elite near the river and downtown. Outside of that area was, an all, was all agricultural. Remember, back in these days, the only produce that was going to market was grown locally and shipped fresh much like a farmer's market is today. McLaughlin Boulevard and Highway 224 did not exist, so the best transportation was the trolley line or the path of the trolley trail today. The local farmers, which were mainly Japanese, Italians, and Germans, worked a variety of fields ranging from celery around the current Milwaukee market marketplace or berries and orchards just east of the Milwaukee Museum plus a combination of vegetables to the north and beautiful flowers and hollies in the current southeast corner and a sprinkle of dairies throughout. Most Milwaukee farmers use the trolley line to bring their produce to Portland markets, but the train tracks on Railroad Avenue sent produce as far as Kansas City. In the mid to late 1930s on the McLaren property, on what is now Lake Road and 43rd Avenue, was a farm operated by a group of Chinese gardeners. There were usually about eight to 10 men living there. The man in charge was Si Sing, an English speaker who stayed on the farm while the other men would return to China about every two years. They raised assorted vegetables using a team of horses for plowing and cultivating. When they harvested, when they harvested the vegetables, they carried them from the field to the barn in large baskets hanging one on each end of a wooden yoke that fits across a man's shoulders. Whenever we went to this place, they would load us up with a large crate of vegetables, then go into their house and get cans of Chinese tea and lychee nuts for us, all with much conversation in Chinese, recalled Don McLaughlin, who grew up on a neighboring farm just to the south. Before the invention of plastic bags to wrap vegetable bunches, Gardeners use a natural reed for that purpose. This reed grew in the wetlands along Kellogg Creek and Scott Creeks. The Chinese gardeners would come and harvest quantities of the reed and dry it, then soak it to soften it back up, 
And when they wanted to use it to tie the bunches of beets, carrots, and onions. Janet Lee is retired from banking and finance. She volunteers in the community and is currently serving as secretary and director for the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association and vice president of the Portland Lee's Family Association. Janet is a second generation Chinese and a native born Portlander. Growing up in the Milwaukee and Oak Grove area, her dad and uncle owned a grocery store in Oak Grove since 1950 and opened Lan Lu Chinese Restaurant in 1962 on McLaughlin Boulevard. The family operated the restaurant for 34 years before it was sold. We cannot thank Janet enough for being here tonight and talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and its everlasting impacts on Chinese immigrants. Please welcome Ms. Janet Lee. Greeting everybody. Um, I did leave a handout out for you to have to browse through. I can only give you a brief summary of what is happening because there was so much going on in that 60 years of racial discrimination. So I will kind of just quickly give you a rundown of what's going on here. Okay, the Chinese immigration to the United States came in. There were no Chinese here. And, and there was, there was, several contributing factors that led the Chinese to travel to the United States. And it was the opium wars in between China and Great Britain from, 19, from 1839 to 1842, and the second opium war between China, Britain, and France at 1856 to 1860. The military superiority of the Europeans gave easy victories over the Chinese. The Chinese economy was impacted with treaties and their ports losing Hong Kong to the British Empire and the legalization of the Opium Wars. The crops failed, poverty and political unrest, floods and droughts came and took over the region. Many of the Chinese in the south part of China in Canton, Guangdong province left the country to travel in search of work in America, which was known as Gold Mountain, Gim San. The, they journeyed across the Pacific Ocean, drawn to the land of golden opportunities. The Chinese immigrants took on mining jobs from the gold rush and construction jobs from the Central Pacific Railroad. Their willingness to work were hired by American companies at a much lower wage, and the white workers grew restless and violent. Anti-immigration sentiments grew when they were racially motivated. This led to imposing taxes and passing discriminating legislation on the Chinese. And that's how the Chinese got here, so. Um, in 1868, Aaron, Anson Burlingame, a lawyer and Republican representative to Congress, became the U.S. Minister to China in 1861. He and the Secretary of State, William Seward, worked to establish the U.S. as a power in the East. Their intent was to gain access to a profitable trading opportunities and foster the spreading of Christianity in Asia by convincing the Chinese to adopt a more Western approach to diplomacy and government. Burlingame negotiated a treaty to protect commerce and conducted in Chinese ports and cities and established the right of China to appoint consuls. That promise, the Chinese gave the right to free immigration and travel within the United States and allowed protection of the Chinese citizens in the United States and the reciprocal access between the two nations, limiting American interference with the internal Chinese affairs. Then Congressman Horatio Page drafted an end to the danger of cheap Chinese labor and immoral Chinese women. The laws barred immigrants and considered it undesirable and defined a person from Asia to 
to be coming to the United States to be forced laborers, Asian women who would engage in prostitution, and all people considered to be convicts. The Page Act prohibited the entry of all Chinese women. In 1879, a law was drafted to target the Chinese, but President Rutherford Hayes vetoed the bill and said it was unconstitutional. So there actually was an attempt to say that that isn't going to work. However, three years later, in 1882, the Chinese Evac Exclusion Act was passed, and it was the first significant law restricting immigration into the U.S. on a specific nationality. Many Americans on the West Coast attributed the declining wages and the economic ills to the Chinese laborers. This act suspended the Chinese immigrants from entering for 10 years and persisted in anti-Chinese sentiments. The Exclusion Act prohibited skilled and unskilled Chinese laborers from entering the country for 10 years, but it did exclude merchants, teachers, students, and diplomats. The law was prohibited federal and state courts from granting citizenship to any Chinese. Then in 1888, the Scots Act prohibited U.S. resident laborers from returning to the U.S., which is where there we think Ah Bing was not able to return, because even though they had proper paperwork, returning labor status was ended, and they would not allow anybody to come through act through, and that was our exit thesis at the time. And this affected 20,000 Chinese at the time. They had gone home to visit, and none were able to return. When the Chinese Exclusion Act expired in 1892, Congress extended it for another 10 years. It expanded the enforcement by requiring the Chinese to prove their lawful presence in the U.S. by carrying a certificate of residence, the precursor to the green card, to be subject to detention or deportation, deportation if you didn't have it. Then in 1902, the act, the Chinese Exclusion Act was actually made Chinese immigration illegal and gaining citizenship was not possible. Movements for restrictions against other undesirable groups also started. Middle Easterners, Hindus, East Indians, Japanese, with the passage of the Immigration Act in 1924. Uh, that time, they were immigration station was at Angel Island. They were detained due to race and nationality, discrimination, and the lengthy interrogation process was handled by all the Chinese. And then in 1924, we had the immigration had further limits, and it was the national origins quota when they limited the two percent of the total number of people in each nationality to enter the U.S. as of the 1890 census. That didn't leave very many people. Aliens were ineligible for U.S. citizenship and were never permitted to enter the U.S. And finally, in 1943, Congress passed a measure to repeal the discriminatory exclusion laws against the Chinese immigrants and to establish a quota for China of 105 visas per year, which is what was allowed. The repeal was a decision based because of World War II as China and US were allies. Then again in 1945, because our, we had alien spouses and our natural children and adopted children of members of the U.S. Armed Forces were allowed to enter the U.S. as non-quota immigrants after World War II. They were exempt from the quota system and granted free passage. So at that point in time, allowed things kind of changed. It took 60 years. But 60 years now later, we're kind of still there. <laughs> we have um, the Immigration and Nationality Act in 1952 repealed the last of the measures of the Asian immigration and eliminated laws preventing Asians from becoming naturalized citizens. 
It also introduced a system of preferences based on skill sets and family reunification. We started a program um, in from 1956 to 1965, which was the Chinese Confession Program. This program was run by the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the INS, and the purpose was to give confessions of illegal entry by from the US citizens and residents of Chinese origin to offer them legal status in exchange. This was described as an amnesty program to clear the paper sons, where Chinese used fake identities to immigrate to the United States. And I can actually say that my grandfather immigrated on paper sons and came to the United States not as husband and wife with my grandma and grandpa, but came as brother and sisters into the United States in the early 1900s. And, was, and so they came with the last name of Chin, and it's really a Lee. But they were able to come up and confess their sins and come up with the proper parents. This Exclusion Act had several consequences on the Chinese Americans. Discrimination, the law rein, just reinforced and perpetuated the discriminating attitudes towards Chinese immigrants. Many Americans, especially on the West Coast, attributed the declining wages and economic ills to the Chinese workers. They felt the Chinese posed a racial danger to the white American society. There was family separation. The fact disrupted many families of Chinese Americans the ban on immigration caused families to be separated for extended periods of time and unable to reunite for many years. Racial profiling was also a problem. Chinese faced racial profiling and discrimination in various aspects of life. They were subject to harassment, violence, and unfair treatment by law enforcement and other institutions. And currently, there are still a the Portland police has been talking is that Chinese won't report crimes because they're just, they're attuned and they're not going to believe them that they won't act and do anything. The other, I, the last item was limited economic opportunities. The Exclusion Act severely limited the economic opportunities for the Chinese immigrants, which came here for the opportunity of Gold Mountain. It restricted their ability to find employment and they couldn't even own land. They were forced into Chinese to live in Chinatowns and banded together for safety and security. And as an uh, update as the Exclusion Act in Oregon, what has happened, things happened such as in 1859, the Oregon Constitution actually said non-residents of China are forbidden to own any mining claims or real estate. In, 19, in 1862, they adopted a law requiring blacks, Chinese, Hawaiians, and mulattoes residing in Oregon to pay an annual tax of $5. In 1863, Portland required Chinese laundries to pay $25 a quarterly fee to operate in the city. In 1866, Oregon banned interracial marriages to prevent whites from marrying anyone black, a quarter or more Chinese or Hawaiian, or half or more Indian. That law was repealed in 1951. And the last item I had was the 1886 in the area just before Ah Bing left was the Anti-Cooley League. They had members burned homes and Chinese markets and dynamited two laundries demanding the Chinese had 30 days to leave the city of Portland. So it was, and Chinese immigrants were driven out in many cities with this anti-Chinese hate area. They were out Oregon City. They actually went to the mill and woke up the guys in the middle of the night, made them get on a boat, the steamship that you saw there, and loaded them up to go to Portland. They In the area of uh, Portland, there was Mount Tabor area. It was very iffy, and Albina also. So, And the last 
big item in Oregon for this was the Chinese massacre at Deep Creek on the Snake River that the brutal murders of 34 Chinese gold miners in 1887 and no one was held accountable for the killings. It's currently now known as the Chinese Massacre Cove and you can see that sometimes if you ever get over to the Snake River to see that sometime. And my last thing is just to talk about was 1882, this passed with President Chester A. Arthur. And in 1943, the act was repealed with Franklin D. Roosevelt. And finally, in October 6 of 2011, the Congress apologized to the Chinese Exclusion Act, and it was on the urging of the 1882 Project Committee from the nation. And so after 60 years of the act, Six years later of the repeal, we still have a lot of bigotry and anti, and I can't even tell you where to go with that because it's almost like reliving itself. Not only is it not to just the Chinese, but it was to the Japanese, and it was to the blacks, it was to the Indians, it was to the Native Americans. I mean, it was just unbelievable. But thank you very much. I hope I had that. So uh, I just have a, a slight conclusion, and then uh, we'll open up the floor to questions if anybody uh, has questions uh, before the director yells at me after I raise up the mic. Um, if you're looking for something to do New Year's Eve, I'll tell you what. We talked about talented and unique people here in Milwaukee. Uh, we have uh, some of the most talented uh, people uh, in Milwaukee uh, on the Arts Committee. And they have dedicated themselves to dropping a Bing Cherry in the parking lot and having a party about it, okay? So New Year's Eve, 9 p.m., check it out. Sam will give you all the details. We're still struggling with how we're gonna do it, but by golly, we're gonna do it, right? That's the attitude that we have, so. Uh, we're all involved with that, and so uh, thanks to Northwest China's help, uh, especially their uh, writing letters and helping us get the grants was a huge uh, way to be able to make that happen. And so that's exciting. So mark your calendar today. Before I let you go tonight, please remember that December 9th is Christmas at the museum, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Young and old are welcome to sit on Santa's lap for their Christmas wish and photo. The young ones get a free gift from Santa, enjoy treats, holiday cheer, and the festivities. Everything is free, so please come by and enjoy. Once again, my name is Greg Hemer, Communications Director for the Milwaukee Historical Society, the owners and operators of the world's largest museum, dedicated to Milwaukee, Oregon history. Open Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., like our Facebook page, Milwaukee History Museum for upcoming events and information. Watch our YouTube videos on Milwaukee Heritage Channel and visit us at milwaukeemuseum.com. A special thank you to our guest speakers here tonight, and also Northwest China Council, Letting Library, City of Milwaukee, and Willamette Falls Studios. Thank you so much, and we'll open on up for questions. Does anybody have any questions for one of our speakers? Oh, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Anybody have any questions? I'm gonna ask a question that was asked on the Milwaukee Arts Committee page. Um, the person was wondering if there is any, ex uh, if there's still any signs of where any of these fruit orchards were, or the cherry orchards, or anything that, of Llewellyn's orchard. Uh, are we gonna allow me to answer that for one? Okay. <laughs> so on the Waverly Country Club uh, 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 lot, uh, you can actually, uh, as you kind of drive up next to the Pioneer Cemetery, those are direct descendants of um, uh, Henderson's and Meek's uh, claim. Uh, yeah, 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 well, yeah, if you, yeah, okay, so I'm directionally challenged. Uh, so if you're driving into Waverly Country Club, right on the right-hand side, 
uh, where right next to the Pioneer Cemetery. Uh, there's like three or four apple trees there. The other thing is, is that there used to be a peach tree uh, that was planted in the back lot of what now we call Old City Hall. Uh, uh, that was actually gave to us from Bur Burling, uh, game, uh, Burling, Ham, Burling Game, Burling Game, Burling uh, Game, and um, and uh, it was planted there. Then it was moved, uh, and now uh, it was removed. But it was uh, put made uh, to a gavel from uh, for the mayor to use, and still being used to this day, right? So uh, the original peach tree. Uh, from Seth Llewellyn's orchard, or came from China that Seth Llewellyn took care of, so on and so forth. The rest of it, um, so you gotta imagine the fruit orchards ended up expanding, so basically from City Hall uh, north, right, over to the country club and that, that's kind of the basis uh, of where all of the orchards were, and that's all now been developed, torn down from uh, Highway 90, or yeah, Highway 99, was kind of the one that kind of really caused that. And then development started to creep up from Old City Hall. Yeah, I'm trying to maintain my property because I have trees, fruit trees on my property that are easily over 100 years old. And, you know, everyone wants me to develop it. Yeah. And it's like, now nah, we need to save that. <laughs> and if the mayor was here, she would tell you that not only do we want to save the trees, but we also want to save that house. Uh, uh, because it, it's a, you know, it's, it's a famous house here in Milwaukee. Is it's that old, right? It's, it goes back to the time. Yeah, so Ah Bing may have seen your house, David. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, pretty, it's a pretty famous house. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? I want to thank everybody. This is excellent, great crowd. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, next year, uh, we are actually going to be focusing on what we call the people. Uh, so this year was 120 years anniversary. Next year, we have our another next four Letting Library Lecture Series, and we are going to uh, talk about the Hadleys at one. Uh, I think we may be doing the Barlow Road uh, uh, skit there. Uh, and uh, some other uh, great people to talk about, like uh, the Llewellyn's Meeks and the fruit industry, uh, and some other modern history and stuff. So, uh, watch, uh, like us on Facebook. Watch our, uh, watch uh, uh, us in the pilot to see when those next ones are, and we'd love to see you out here again. All right, thank you all so much for showing up.